There's arguably three historical events that sum up the human experience on Earth. Our theories of creation, the American Revolution, and lastly, the Haitian Revolution. These three significant moments in history revealed the human condition, and those moments may just be all that we need to comprehend our humanity, civilization, ingenuity, industry, cruelty, and exceptionalism. The residual effects of these three events have its benefits and consequences. For Haiti, it's detrimental to obtain autonomy by any means, especially through how nationhood has been obtained in the Western Hemisphere. Unfair taxes and treatment ignite revolution. As Haiti continues to forge ahead, a republic amongst empires, the odds are still enormous. Bias treatment continues till this day. Setbacks are within Haiti's borders and outside Haiti's borders, and natural disasters damage infrastructure year after year. Today, let's talk about unfair treatment of Haiti and what the Haitian American population can help undo. In today's episode, Stop the Steal, with me are two co-writers, Joseph Blocker and Mitu Gulati. The title of the article on Slate.com is, The U.S. Stole Billions from Haiti. It's time to give it back. Joseph Blocker is professor of law at Duke University School of Law. Blocker's principal academic interests include federal and state constitutional law, the First and Second Amendments, capital punishment, and property. And Mitu Gulati, professor of law at Duke University. Mitu Gulati is on the faculty of the Duke University School of Law. His research focuses on sovereign bond contracts. His articles have appeared in the Maine and Tulane Law Reviews. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Delighted. I have to start with the first two paragraphs of your article. Haiti is in desperate need after a devastating earthquake, a hurricane, a presidential assassination, and not enough vaccines to stop the Delta variant. International aid is pouring in, which is all good, but not good enough. It is time to ask about what Haiti is owed, not in terms of international benevolence or moral duty, but as a matter of basic legal rights and principles. We're gonna dive right into our topic for today, why you wrote the article, and then we're going to go into uh, the reasonable justifications why uh, this was wrong and um, specifics on uh, what America owes Haiti at this point in time. Why did you write the article? Well, the two of us have been writing together for years uh, on a variety of topics relating to borders and boundaries and how they change and how we might think about um, sort of welfare enhancing changes, those changes that would make people better off, um, whether that means sort of, you know, furthering the, pro the ongoing process of decolonization or perhaps renegotiating existing borders. Um, but it was really, it was me too who came across this particular example, um, and it's absolutely fascinating, I think unknown to a lot of many uh, law professors in the United States. So of course, that, that attracted our interest. And there's a really heavy justice components here, which is that something was taken of great value. Um, and as we argue in the article, um, you know, reparations of some form or remedy could be made. So and I think we I was... started thinking about this in the context of our recent litigation. It, it is the litigation that is referred to as the Chagos litigation, where islands or archipelago belonging to Mauritius was taken by the British in the context of decolonization. And international courts very recently, a number of them have ruled that 
the island was taken improperly and A needs to be given back and B, and this is less certain, uh, there are potentially damages that are owed to Mauritius because the imperial powers, it's uh, here, the UK and the US sort of combined to take this property in the decolonization process, uh, those damages might be owed. And uh, that gave us, in some sense, the inspiration to look at this island, which also was taken with very little of what we would think of as legal process from a country that is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And, uh, you know, deep injustices in the 1800s could easily be done by powerful nations, but maybe it is time for a reconciliation. Thank you, Professor Mitu. And let's talk about that. The U.S. never had a reasonable justification in any legal term for seizing the island belonging to Haiti. How and why did this happen? We're going to begin with Professor Blocker. Well, and I may even turn this one over to, um, to my co-author because the, the, um, the, the mechanism here by which the, the United States ended up take, taking the island is something called the Guano Islands Act, which is a fascinating piece of legislation which is still on the books today and that um, means you may be even in a better position to explain if I pass it off to you. I'm not sure I'm in a better position, but I'm, I'm certainly very outraged. So you might think that in the international context, if there are islands out there in the world, you couldn't take it except under international law, or at least without asking the permission of other people who might own this island. So this island is closest to Haiti. The way the U.S. took it is the U.S. passed a law, its own law, that said, we can go take islands from anyone so long as we don't see anybody there, essentially. It's not clear that that was legal under international law. And it was it's not even clear that you could do that within the US. In fact, I'm fairly certain you can't just take people's property within the US just because you pass a law. But they took it from Haiti because they knew with force they could keep it and they desperately needed the bird shit that was on that island, a million tons. That was invaluable then uh, because bird droppings at that point were, were, I think the price was about one fourth the price of gold. Literally, this was gold. They took it, I mean, you probably know the history, which is that at the point when the island was taken, the U.S. did not even recognize Haiti as a nation because they were so fearful that this country born out of a slave revolution would inspire similar revolutions on the U.S. mainland. So that's sort of the, the simple version of the story. And let's talk about the legal ramifications here, you know, due to the fact that you are correct, they did not recognize Haiti as a nation. Uh, and while they did not recognize them as, as a nation, they came upon their territory to take something that belonged to them. How could Haiti have defended themselves at that time? At the time, I think it would have been very difficult. Uh, I mean, the, 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 Haitian, the Haitian government at the time did object, um, uh, and the United States responded by sending its navy and, you know, literally parked warships and warned the government off, you don't want to you know, interfere with the US-backed mining operations that are, ha are happening here. So I certainly don't fault Haiti. I mean, Haiti raised, raised an objection at the time, what we would call a law, a timely objection, um, but just was not in a position um, to, to, to see it through with the kind of military force that the United States had at the time. And so um, you know, for all the reasons that Mitsu just said, I think at the time it happened, this was a power play, and there's probably nothing uh, that Haiti could have done, I think, differently at the time. What can be done today in terms of reclaiming what belongs to Haiti, along with the billions mining the island generated? This is a great question, and it's one that we start to address in the article, but I think it just really requires a lot more thinking by you know us and others who are closer to the issue. But you know, Mitsu mentioned earlier that in law, you can't just go around and take other people's property without consequence, and that's basically what happened here. 
if that if you do that, um, there are consequences that flow from it. One, you have to give back what you took. And two, you usually have to pay some kind of damages, call it a remedy, call it reparations or whatever else. So, you know, we can think about both those things. One, one obvious thing is that the United States could return Navassa to Haiti, uh, which still claims it. It's still part of Haiti's constitution, even though the Haitian government hasn't really pressed the claim um, for the past few decades. And in fact, the United States did give back a number of the islands. There were almost 100 islands claimed under that statute that me to mentioned, the Guano Islands Act. Many of them were returned to Great Britain or Honduras or Venezuela, or was, was protecting them. But N Navassa, it never happened. Um, even though the mining activity stopped there right around the turn of the, of the previous century, not about 1902, I think was the last mining activity on Navassa. You know, eventually chemical fertilizers became widely available. Guano wasn't as valuable anymore. So under the terms of the law, we could have just given it back, like given it up. But instead, the United States just repurposed it. Um, we put a lighthouse there, um, which became automated. There was a military sort of reconnaissance unit station there. Um, it was, you know, of some interest maybe during the World Wars. But today, you, you can't even visit without permission. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's maintained by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as some kind of wildlife refuge. Apparently, radio operators like to go there sometimes. It's not a, it's not a crucial part of the uh, U.S. economy as it might have been in the 1850s or the 1860s. So why not just give it back? Um, you know, one reason may be that people in power here would not want to start pulling at the threads here. Maybe they're... Happy to give back Navassa, but we have a lot of other territories which are in the same legal category, and some of them have lots and lots of people living on them. Puerto Rico has 4 million American citizens living on it. It is also a territory. American Samoa, the Northern Marianas Islands, like these are all parts of the United States' lingering empire. They're all effectively colonies, and it may be that we just don't want to go down that road. The second thing would be calculating what we owe, as you say, the sort of billions um, uh, that, um, that that was taken. And this, I think, is really the more, maybe in some respects, more relevant thing. Like giving back the island now, when guano is no longer a valuable resource, doesn't really do much to right the wrong. Um, so what you would normally do in law is sort of calculate present value of the of the you know the resource that was taken at the time, sort of back of the envelope calculations. You know, based on the price that Mitch mentioned earlier, about you know quarter of the price of gold at the time times a million tons of guano gets you about two billion dollars uh, just in 1857. And if that you know if that if that if that were to grow in value one to three percent per year for 150 years, you're looking at 10 billion and potentially way up from that. So we'd have to think a lot more about what the calculations would be, but it's a significant number. Absolutely. And during a difficult time, like right now, uh, Haiti can use that money in so many different ways. I think that's right. I mean, one of the things that inspired the article we were already writing on it was just, you know, seeing this is another argument for not aid. This is not like the, not, not, a, not a matter of giving, you know, we, the United States may have a moral or a political obligation to help out where it can, but this is a matter of righting a wrong. But doing it at a time when that remedy it would be especially welcomed, um, given that the people of Haiti have just struggled with so much, um, especially you know over the years, but especially in the last year. And it's very significant to mention that while Haiti is uh, called the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, we never take out the time to identify why that is. Right. Uh, specifically, situations like this where a powerful country that did not even recognize their sovereignty came in and took something that was valuable to them, to their to their economy, right, to the people and gave them absolutely nothing in return. That brings us right into our next question. How can the international community assist in this process? How can we all hold America accountable? So, you know, as a starting point, it is not just the United States uh, that has skeletons in its closet, even if we just look at Haiti. So, you know, Joseph and I elsewhere has looked at and talked about 
the Haitian independence debt of 1825, where France imposed a 150 million franc obligation on Haiti for having become independent from France. That's worth many hundreds of billions of dollars today. Now, to get directly to the question you asked about how can the international community produce some remedy for these wrongs, there, there are two methods that we know of. And, you know, we're lawyers, so we always think about law. And so that's why both the, the Navasa claim and the Haitian independence debt claim are so appealing to us because there is potentially legal mechanisms that can be used in the courts of these Western countries, the US and France, where the law would recognize a legal remedy. So you can use the legal route, but we, we are not innocents. Uh, we recognize also that these are political questions. And the only way I think, and Joseph might have a different answer, to me, unless civil society and that includes our students, unless they take up this question as one of being a historical wrong where restitution must be given, uh, I don't think we have any chance. But this is not, it bears emphasizing reparations. It is not charity. Haiti's economic growth we know from The Economist would be very, very different had they not had to spend their resources, their scarce resources on paying back debt, and had they had some resources from the guano. So, yeah, I mean, we have to do a historical counterfactual, but I think the crucial part is making people aware of this, and not just people in Haiti, but all over the world. Absolutely, absolutely. I and that leads to the final question. As professors, what role, if any, can our education system play during this very uh, distinct time for Haiti? Well, I think one obvious thing that we can do as educators and the educational system can do is, is simply just make people aware of this, this history. I mean, um, we are not the first to notice Navassa or to write about it. Um, I should say, uh, for example, Jacqueline Charles of the Miami Herald has written some fantastic articles about Navassa over the years. We've, um, we've drawn on her, on her, on her reporting, uh, even in our scholarship. But I think most Americans, just speaking of our domestic educational system, just don't know what the territories are, whether it's Navassa or, for that matter, Puerto Rico, or, as I said earlier, the Northern Marianas Islands or Guam or American Samoa. These are all parts of the United States, but they're not states. Like, the people living in those places don't have the same voting rights, for example, as those of us who live on the mainland. And that, I think, just goes by the wayside. I mean, you, you see it in the way people talk about, um, the way people on the mainland talk about um, uh, uh, these territories. I think people in the United States are not aware at all of our history with Haiti. Um, and it's not just Navasta. I mean, you know, as, as, as Mitsu um, pointed out to me when we were in the early stages of researching this paper, we basically just took over the country for a long time under uh, 1915, I think is when it started, for basically two decades, took, took gold reserves ostensibly to protect them. I mean, it's just an astonishing aggression, act of aggression. And I don't think people in the United States learn about it. I didn't, at least growing up. So one thing is just the awareness raising that Mitzi was just talking about. The second is that, you know, we can start thinking concretely about remedies. Like, what would it take to right this wrong to the degree we can still do? And, and here again, I'll echo what Mitzi was just saying. You know, we're lawyers and we're law professors. And so we think in terms of legal remedies. And that's been, you know, the focus of our arguments here. Um, but others could help, you know, a, a economists can help calculate what would have, you know, help work on that counterfactual that Me Too was, was discussing. Um, you know, this is a complicated problem that's going to require a lot of thinking, uh, a lot of thinking to fix. So this is, we hope, at least just one, one small part of that. Thank you so very much, Professor Blocker, Professor Me Too. It was a pleasure having you. Any final words? Just thank you for having us and, being, and letting us be part of this discussion. This has really been wonderful for us. 
Until next time, we look forward to connecting with you guys once more. Have a great day. We have all heard the phrase, what is done is done, which means there shouldn't be any recourse to undo what's been done. Leave it as is. Tell me, what are your thoughts on this matter? Leave a comment and we will return to this issue. Remember, the conversation does not end here. Let's keep it going with friends and family. And if we don't agree, let's learn to agree to disagree. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Until the next conversation, have a great day. Hi, my name is Naomi Blamir, author, coach, and businesswoman. I am here in our magnificent space, Balancing Life Workspace. Today is just an amazing day for us as an organization, for our vision and the trajectory of our future. Balancing Life Workspace is a space designed with you in mind. We've created a space where you can connect, create, and cultivate. It is an affordable workspace for the freelancer, for the independent contractor, for the startup, or for the person who's looking to downsize. Wherever you are in your vision, wherever you are in your entrepreneurship, Come check us out and see whether or not our space can provide services to you. Thank you. Schedule your private tour for North Miami's very first co-working space today. We are located at 685 Northeast 126th Street on the corner of 126th and 7th Ave, just minutes from City Hall. For plans and pricing, visit our site at www.blworkspaces.com or call us Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. through 6 p.m. at 305-735-2105. Until then, have a balanced day.